Uh, greetings, friends. It's Chapo, Monday, April 4th, 2022. Uh, gentlemen, back from a weekend. Let's go. How are we feeling? Just a, a, another week of the news. Another, another more news. Well, yeah, the, the sun keeps on rising. The news keeps on printing. I keep on reacting to it. I keep copying the link to the tweet and, and saying, I guess this is happening now. It's it continues to be a normal world. Um, we're here. We're here for it. Um, all right. So I guess just uh, uh, first things first, big congratulations to the Amazon Union in Staten Island. Now, for, uh, for, don't want to don't blow, blow, blow the bells and whistles too soon on this. Uh, they still need a contract, but a uh, big, big, big victory on the union vote for the uh, Amazon people. And I will say for listeners, we should have an interview coming tomorrow if all goes well uh that should be of some interest if you've been following uh this case but um we'll be interviewing yeah. jeff bezos <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we ask him how he's feeling no we're one's really asking if there's anything we can do for him if we, we could rub his tummy maybe no one's really tried to get his side of the story that's what we've noticed in all this and that's what we're trying to fix well i mean a question that comes up over and over again is why would these people seek to seek to get get in between like a family relationship? Why would they screw up a family dynamic that was working perfectly? Uh, I got to say this, this polyamory stuff has, has gone way too far. We, you have a series of, of beautiful monogamous relationships between the Amazon corporation and these individual workers. And now you got this, uh, these union people bumbling in to be a, an awkward third. They're, they're making fondue. <laughs> when people just want to Netflix and chill. Poly organizers are coming into your workplaces and uh, suggesting that they, quote, open things up. Well, let me tell you, I've been in relationships like that and it never works. Uh, it just screws up the whole dynamic. I want to communicate with my wife directly. No, no, I, I don't, I don't want to. I want to communicate with him through a third party who happens to be having sex with her. Yeah. No, thank you. But yeah, like, you know, it's just uh, it's 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 family dynamic. You know, like. The family structure in America is breaking down. The relationship between parent and child and the relationship between employer and em employee. And there's a lot of sickos out there that are trying to take advantage of that. And so, yeah, like our interview tomorrow with Jeff Bezos, uh, we'll be talking, we'll, we'll be touching on all these issues. But um, before I want to get there, uh, did you guys see um, uh, Jen Psaki react to this news? She seemed oh. uh, very thrilled. She's having. She was. She was very excited for that. Question is: Is there any comment on the um, the vote in Staten Island by Amazon workers to unionize? Sure. Amazon to do that. Well, the president was glad to see workers ensure their voices are heard uh, with respect to important workplace decisions. He believes firmly that every worker in every state must have a free and fair choice to join a union and the right to bargain collectively with their employer. Uh, the Amazon workers in Staten Island made their choice to organize a grassroots union and bargain for better jobs and a better life. Well, yeah, uh, it was it was a it was a terse response to say the least. I just want to like pro uh, act coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> if you thought just, neoliberalism was dead before, just wait till the pro act passes, which is coming soon. No, uh, needless to say, she was, uh, she was, you know, uh, she made a statement that was, uh, she was very glad, she was very happy for these Amazon workers that they uh, won this vote. But uh, which you know, it, Amazon hired her former uh, employers to um, uh, kill this union drive. Uh, Jen Psaki, of course, ran the DC office of the Global Strategy Group which is an influential Democratic polling firm, which Amazon hired to fight unionization efforts on uh, the Staten Island facility. Uh, just reading here from uh, CNBC, Amazon tapped an influential consulting and polling firm with close ties to Democratic political groups to help the company thwart a critical unionization effort at a Staten Island, New York warehouse, CNBC has learned. Global Strategy Group, which has served as a polling partner for a pro-Biden super PAC ahead of the 2020 election, has been working for Amazon since at least last year to produce anti-union materials, according to documents viewed by CNBC. Amazon fought aggressively to beat back unionization efforts on Staten Island, just as it had in Bessemer, Alabama, where workers concluded a second union vote after the initial one failed last year. Workers, warehouse staffers across the company amped up their activism during the COVID pandemic, demanding safer worker conditions and better pay. The videos and printed materials distributed by Global Strategy Group attempt to discourage employees from joining a union. They use phrases like one team working together and 
unpack it. Get the facts about unions. A slogan repeated on Amazon's anti-union website, Unpack JFK 8. Some of the materials tout the many benefits that Amazon already provides, including healthcare, vacation time, and opportunities for improving job skills. GSG, uh, GSG employees in New York, Connecticut, and Washington, D.C. have been involved in the project. Documents show. Barbara Russell, Amazon's Global Director of Employee Relations, is helping to oversee the work with GSG. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, Jen Psaki's um, former job. You know, I mean, it's just it's a shame she has to fight so hard against them now in the Biden White House, which, you know, supports all this stuff. Uh, well, you know, not you for see- long. Uh, uh, <laughs> she's she's on her way out. Uh, her audition went really well. And now she's going to get a gig at MSNBC. They really liked her headshot. Yeah. And, and like that, it is awesome now that government postings are now just explicitly auditions to, I mean, yeah, obviously get lobbying money and all that, but that's, that's just assumed. Uh, the real goal is, yeah, get, get on TV. Cause what else is there? You sure as hell not governing. You might as well uh, make more money for uh, less hours and uh, get to be famous. Yeah. But, MSNBC, it's like, damn, aim high. I don't think anyone's used Periscope except for people who have been banned from every platform in the world. I think that's sort of the last resort. But I think if she just like had a Periscope show, it would get more viewers than MSNBC. MSNBC is getting slaughtered. It still has its its small band of fans. And 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 like when the collapse comes, you can ensure that there will be a a, uh, a dedicated hardcore of you, whatever, uh, you know, warlord uh, faction you end up part of. Yeah, I mean, I kind of think I think she's better positioned than others to be a big media star because they do love her like the They the remaining, love Saki. The, yeah, the, the, remaining Saki Biden loyal, the remaining Biden loyalists like love her. And I mean, I guess I guess she could supplant like Joy Reid or like someone else with like exactly 33,000 viewers. In the yeah, thirty three thousand people who would like die for her. She'll yeah. be like Bodica. Oh no, I think I think she'll have more than that. I mean, like it, it just I don't know. It, it it seems like it seems like moving backwards a bit. Everyone obviously wants to be a media star, but the cable news route seems to be foreclosed on, unless you're Tucker. Well, if the CIA doesn't work out, there's always journalism. Tucker learned that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because, you know, if you're, if you're too stupid to be a spook, uh, journalism will hire anyone, basically. And basically, you can still do the same job. So better pay, too. Yeah, no, it's, it's the only move, as we, un- as we well understand. <laughs> if you're not in the media, what the hell are you doing? But just as like, a, like a, you know, we're talking about like uh, the, the current Biden administration people. Uh, gang, I think I found the worst former Obama person. Oh, Jay Carney. No, 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 no. Oh, no, Jay, no Jay, the, Jay Carney's the, up there. Jay Carney is up there. He he was uh you know he he was the one who was um uh, slandering uh, Chris Smalls uh, last year for spreading COVID or whatever. Uh, this this one is former former Obama official uh, Brandon Friedman, and uh, I I like I mean this is a since deleted tweet. He was responding to Chris Hayes of MSNBC, who you know was saying you know, gosh. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, like maybe this is weird to point out, but like, you know, there are plenty of very profitable, successful companies all over the world that have unionized workforces. Gee willikers. Uh, Brandon Friedman uh, replies to him in this since deleted tweet. One reason I've always been sort of standoffish with the very idea of unions is that they're a sign of weak governance, as in to protect their interests. Workers are forced to band together to do what government should be doing. Yeah, you know, if Obama had had 62 votes in the Senate, we would have had democratic centralism. Yeah, that rule, because uh, he's making this point. uh, Ideally, the government should be providing all this stuff. Uh, And it's like, yeah, they should. It's so rational and reasonable that they would do that. And yet they don't. Why is that? How could that be? And it's weird. It's like. Really, only when you have strong labor unions is there really any political pressure at all on making any of those things happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that as soon as it goes away, there the status quo is to demolish them. It's really odd. It's it's like it's like there's something other than rational governance uh, determining the decisions of these bodies. I don't know what it could be. Yeah, it's been a banner week for uh, former Obama guys just walking around saying who farted. <laughs> so Jim David, Messina David. has uh, wisely stayed quiet. Yeah. I haven't seen any Messina, g- Messina gems out there. I guess he's yeah. just he's stoically sitting on his lily pad in England. <laughs> God, he's figuring God. out there's got to be a way flies that I out can, of the air. There's got to be a way that I could actually uh, I could 
somehow get Keir Starmer executed by the state if he hires me. <laughs> God, don't I, you... I know I have it in me to have that happen. They bring back the death penalty just to kill him after I run his campaign against Boris Johnson. Don't you wish he was working for the Tories in 2019? Different yeah, world need him in. yeah oh god if he'd only been, oh my god if they kept him around you know if god, bernie too smart. oh my god bernie had like a billion fucking dollars and they spent it on like tv ads for people who think he's russian anyway yeah they they, they should have they should have like gone to jay carney and been like here's 200 million dollars to work for joe Biden. get all of them get messina get carney yeah no just get all get messina especially and yeah. then Biden loses. What a waste. What a sad waste. But uh, David Axelrod, the post where it's like, oh, d- has anyone ever had a problem where their insurance just suddenly <laughs> like stops covering something and they have to pay $7,000 a year for pundit medicine like I have to take? <laughs> yeah, no, he said my, uh, my, my pundit pills have <laughs> skyrocketed. Yeah. Yeah, he, oh, said some pill, he said some pill he takes has now cost $638 a month. And he was like, who can afford this? Your money or your life is a, is a hell of a thing to be offering people in terms of health care or whatever. It was just like, be like, wow, like, are, are you the same David Axelrod that <laughs> worked for the Obama administration? No yeah, way. Yeah. A couple more hits from uh, this Brandon, Fried- Brandon Friedman guy. Uh, you know, he used to be he used to be a troop, too. Oh, yeah. No, uh, his bio ends with once a soldier. And does it does it finish that statement? Uh, I don't know. Once a soldier, then what? Uh, well, actually, like, funnily enough, now now his current gig as he works for this fucking it's like a tea company that says it works oh. in, <laughs> in post conflict spaces. <laughs> oh, man, that is like, oh, man, that is it. That is a beautiful detail. I, it's like, um, uh, yeah, if like Dave Agers wrote a novel where a character used to work for Obama. I would be like, this wouldn't happen in real life. It's too perfect. It's too ridiculous. But no, he really does it. <laughs> and I'm just like, well, I mean, come on. Like, uh, dude, open up shop in Libya. There's a ton of new, po- new post-conflict spaces that you're like creating the opportunity to invest in. Talk about a loose uh, labor market, too. Thanks to you. <laughs> loose leaf tea, loose leaf workers. Yeah. Start, picking, start picking those leaves. Uh, no, but uh, uh, Brandon also had some thoughts about... God, what, this guy's name's Brandon, and he worked for the Obama administration. What a fucking blown opportunity. <laughs> uh, he, he had to say this uh, about the, uh, the Ukraine war. He says, um, no cities during the Iraq invasion were ever made to look like Maripol, Bucha, or other heavily <laughs> damaged places in Ukraine. The heaviest fighting was in Nazaria and Baghdad, and neither came close to what we see today. One of these figures is wildly inaccurate, possibly both. I haven't reviewed empirical research over the years, but just based on first and second hand observation and what I know about civilians and war carnage, I feel safe estimating Russia killed more civilians in its invasion than the U.S. in Iraq by at least an order of magnitude. Eh, You know, I'm eyeballing it. And uh, let me just tell you, that's a lot of casualties. Definitely more than the one we did. (laughs) I mean, like for for going the fact that he's you know completely wrong, like something like 60 to 70 percent of the buildings in fallujah were destroyed um, okay you say that but, you say that felix but he the, the, he has pretty you know he has uh, already already defeated this line of inquiry quite ably by pointing out that fallujah happened after the initial invasion oh, of you course. see you see he's talking about the invasion which was you know prosecuted um uh, uh quite quite morally but the 10 years plus of war that happened after it is a different matter entirely and one that, you know, uh, supports his point that, you know, America, America would never do anything like what uh, Russia did to Maripol to, you know, a, a city full of people. But I mean, at least they wouldn't do that during an invasion. They would do it yeah, you know, during, during an occupation, occupation during an occupation like, of a war yeah. Although that happened even after during the invasion. The, even during the invasion, they <laughs> yeah. were, the U.S. was using like uh, artillery on cities. They did that shit. Mm-hmm. And the artillery is not guided in any fucking sense. And it's loaded in American munitions with fucking depleted uranium. Yeah. I mean, among our many crimes in that country, um, just an absurd amount of increased birth defects since we used depleted uranium shells in the We're the only ones who do that, by the way. Yeah. So that's one thing you could say. Whatever's happening in Maripol, nobody, you could, you, there's not going to be some giant spike in fucking cancer, uh, pediatric cancer diagnosis that's going to last for decades. That's the Uncle Sam touch. Well, you, you really, you really see why old Brandon, uh, Mister Let's Go Brandon Friedman, is 
he's sort of C tier former Obama guy because he just he he kind of gave up the game. You know, everyone in that fold is so excited about this, so happy over this war because a you know this is this is the end goal of our Ukraine policy for the last decade was to make them fight our war for us and then mm-hmm. point to the destruction and death of this country that we've already put through so fucking much. This country where all every every employer in Ukraine with more than 50 employees has a special little fucking escape valve where the sons and daughters of US politicians could siphon money out. Every awful thing we have forced on that country, uh, we can now point to the dead and maimed and go, look, look, we told you Russia's bad. But the secondary thing, the more emotional uh, prize for people like Brandon Freeman is now Americans don't have to talk about Iraq. We don't have to reconcile with Iraq. We don't have to think about Libya. They're, no, they're, look, there's a new bad thing, which like, you know, if if anything, we're just looking at our mirror. I, I would argue that we're still the great Satan. We're the primary mover of evil in this world. But he sort of he blows the whole the whole prize by bringing Iraq back up again. Well, he, he tried to the stack whole... these two, try to stack these two together when they really don't. He blows everything because he says, uh, "And what I know about civilians and war carnage, speaking from my own personal experience in yeah. the matter, it's like, dude, what the what are you talking about, man? Like, don't he you feel, seen you know, a million don't, posts? Don't you feel, don't you feel guilty about any of this shit? No, I mean, like, I'm sure that like." the Russian military is doing like absolutely fucking oh, God, awful yeah. things there, like positive. I, I, I'm sure of that because um, that's probably what Brandon Friedman was doing in Iraq. This is yeah. generally what invading armies do. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean, the distinction that will always animate these uh, arguments and that, and that undergirds all the assumptions that go into saying something this absurd, something that's so easily dunkable is that whatever we do, we had to do it for and, 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 you know, you could argue, oh, you're just talking about like the narrow self-interest of like, you know, uh, America, you know, uh, as opposed to some greater good. But they would argue that in a world filled with uh, bad actors, uh, our self-interest is the, the greatest good. And so if we decide we have to do something like go into Iraq, even if it was, a, you know, an oops at the time, we felt we had to do it. Everything we do is under that. A moral umbrella of necessity. Other countries act out of bad motives, like they because the narrow self interest of their country is not like elemental to the greater good. Putin, if he should allow himself to be uh, overthrown, he should do the right thing because it doesn't matter what happens in Russia. It only matters that America persists and prevails. And you know, like, and and also the the other line that these people use to exonerate themselves is that they're just like. Well, like all of the barbarity that we did in Iraq, it wasn't systematic and intentional. And then they're like, yes, I know about Abu Ghraib and torture. Yes. Like, granted, that was pursued systematically. But, you know, like we're not just mercilessly massacring civilians like we would never the cruelty, do that. The cruelty wasn't the point. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, the yeah. distinction. Yeah. That's why people love liberals love saying that, because our cruelty is an unnecessary byproduct. Their cruelty is something that they that they enjoy. And it's not. Right, if you may have fun. That's the liberal credo. Yeah, we have to do all this stuff. We have to, uh, you know, squeeze the, the global, uh, the losers in the global order into oblivion in the face of, you know, uh, uh, massive catastrophes, uh, ecological and otherwise. Uh, but we, we're not having fun doing it. Yeah. And if we, you have uh, fun doing it, then uh, you shouldn't be in charge. And that's yeah. why the, the, the uh, Washington led Western consensus has to defeat all these nasty uh, uh, re- revanchist nationalist movements because yeah. they have fun doing it, and that's unseemly. Would Russians ever make the green zone? Ask yeah. yourself that. Would they ever have, <laughs> would they ever have a, uh, a P.F. Chang's yeah. right next to their embassy in Kiev if they took it? I don't think so. Oh, no, I meant the movie The Green Zone. <laughs> would they ever, I meant would they ever make a horrible movie that 25 people see that's about how hard it is to do That's horrible. a very good point, yeah. I kind of hope they do. Ah, jeez, ah, dang it. Yeah, I hope they do do that. I hope they just, like, they just complete, completely do, like, every single thing we do. Yeah. I hope no, they elect, like, a Russian back. Obama who's like, yep. I, was, I was against the Ukraine invasion. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> there's like a the invade they, Chechnya. They, they they remake uh in the Valley of Ella with Steven Seagal in the Tommy Lee Jones role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, they I'm, do. I'm gonna they, tell you. I'm gonna tell you one motherfucking thing about my son. President Putin snatched away every last motherfucking birthday. <laughs> oh, doing, doing, doing like uh, there, there's zero dark thirty, but it's about like Steven Seagal killing Jonathan Van Ness. <laughs> <laughs> After a long time, our enemy is defeated. But all my all my friends who turned motherfucking gay along the way, <laughs> I think was this shit worth it? Blood? I don't even know. <laughs> Russian Russian Catherine R- Ramza Katarov, your family hates you, sucker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all your warlords, they turn their back on you, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's just like a. I mean, like Felix, like you, you you had you had these guys dead to rights years ago when you uh you know loudly proclaimed the honor of the Hillary man versus these spineless fucking worms in the Obama administration. Because it's like I don't know, man. Like it's just like the the introduction of these guys is just like what like what what exactly separates them from like Mitt Romney on in, in terms of their like attitudes on like labor war. Nothing. No, taxes, Mitt Romney is one like, of them. Yeah. Yeah, it's just an accident. I mean, the only difference is that we're on opposite sides of the partisan no, line. The only difference is Jay Carney likes guided by voices. That's it. He that knows who him, guided by voices is. Yeah, that makes him more repulsive to me. Yeah, like I, it's like it's charming to me that Mitt Romney probably like listens to Pat Boone, <laughs> but like, yeah, oh man, no. Nothing. See, but like media consumption is virtue for a liberal. It has to be because they forsworn any you know actual responsibility for anything. They have accepted that getting as high as you can in the hierarchy of blood is the only worthwhile human pursuit so they have to find a somewhere to imagine themselves to be worthy of their position and it comes from their virtue which doesn't come from action their actions have to go against anything virtuous it comes from consumption like it does for the rest of us and specifically media consumption like the fact that obama was black was huge right and 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 helped him become president his enduring popularity and, and the way that he shaped the Democratic Party had way more to do with the fact that he liked the wire. Yeah. Like that was mind blowing for liberals. And it gave them this idea that like if you're doing horrible imperial shit or horrible corporate shit, but you watch the wire, it means you're doing it because there's no other option. Because obviously you get it, right? You get it. So you would never do something bad that you didn't have to do. And, and the, the fact that he listens, the, the, whole, the fact the whole, that Jay Carney's a cool Xer with cool X values, and uh, Romney's a fucking square who listens to the Osmonds while looking at uh, the Wiki Feet page for Kristen Cinema, that makes him worthy of power, and Romney not. Yeah, um, and the Wire is sort of the perfect show because it it it, it shows all these uh, completely ignored problems in the inner city that uh, exist in every city in America. And by the time it gets near the end of the show, they're like, all right, so the problem starts in schools. <laughs> if the schools were better, this wouldn't happen. Maybe if we turn what if maybe if we turn them all over to McDonald's, they would be more efficient at least. Because yeah. that's the thing, it's like the solution is not uh to be found in stuff like the wire, only the problem. The solution could be pulled out of the air, aka, you know, what all of the uh, billionaire funded uh, NGOs have to say the problem is all the people who have the same interests as you, but also have charts to show you. And of course, these charts are accurate because these guys watch the wire, too. I just got to say that, like, if if it had been Hillary was the president, that passed the ACA and her equivalent, David Axelrod, like his insurance just like dropped his his funded pills. And he had to pay like an extra. <laughs> Terry McAuliffe. Year. Yeah, Terry McAuliffe. He would never say he would never, ever acknowledge that. No, he because he knows that an extra six hundred dollars a month wouldn't mean shit to him. Yeah. Well, th- that. But also it's like, no, he would kill himself before dishonoring yeah. the administration like that. Absolutely. I mean, David Axelrod is sort of a Ronin because he was disinvited from the Obama birthday bash. <laughs> that is true. But, you know, we're kind of seeing why he was disinvited. Sort of a chicken and egg situation. Honestly, the fact that he did not commit seppuku in front of that hideous fucking house obama has in 
of Martha's Vineyard is proof that he has no honor. Yeah. A samurai's honor is not worn for show. Okay, so like, like as long as we're talking about, um, you know, uh, the Democrats, let's talk. Let's talk. Let's talk some strategies that could help them in the midterms, because you know, <laughs> they, we like, come on, come on. There's got to be something. There's got to be something here. You know, I'm reading a lot of articles. It's like, you know, ooh, this this Gen Z turnout's not looking great for Joe Biden. You know, what are we gonna do? Uh, we got to do something for them. And you know, Matt, I, I've seen. A, I think you're right about this. I've seen a lot of people saying like, why. Why can't Joe Biden just like deschedule marijuana at the federal level or, you know, like it's like, wouldn't that be an easy, easy W for him? I think you're right that it's now totally too late to yeah, make a difference no. in that regard. Like that is uh-uh. not moving the fucking needle because yeah, like, especially like, so. Yeah. Like all the, all the young people who want weed legalized, it's, it's a good chance it is legalized in the states they live in by this point. And there's just so much other stuff. I can't imagine it really getting anybody that excited. I mean, it's obviously the correct like moral and like obviously there's political benefits to it. It's like a broadly popular policy, but uh, it's just like these these magic bullets. People think that he could just be like, just start, z- you know, zinging off or whatever. Like, OK, here's one. Here, here's an idea that I think is worth um, considering. Um, can somebody um, like, you know, per- perhaps President Joe Brandon or or just make a political issue out of um, just junk and scam email and phone calls? Which now are it basically you can't use your phone anymore. Ninety eight percent of like all phone calls and like emails that you receive are just straight up like crimes, just straight yeah. up people trying to rob you, and there doesn't seem to be any attempt made to just like stop this or I don't know. Hey, could could you cut down? So like maybe fit, maybe half of the phone calls and emails I get are not just attempting to rob me. Man, uh, actually, uh, this is be- yeah. I know you're saying, well, why isn't Brandon doing something about this? This is actually part of his abolitionist agenda to allow these crimes to go uh, unpoliced because of ACAB. <laughs> yeah. Uh, ACAB includes people who would stop uh, them from calling you about uh, how you have to pay your IRS bill and Amazon gift cards. <laughs> the scam phone call thing, which every American seems to get about 30 a day, I've noticed. Yeah. Uh, I mean, time and time again. I, I I have to say, what what why even have an NSA? <laughs> what the fuck are we doing with this thing? We built the greatest surveillance apparatus in the history of humanity, something that no one ever could have conceived. They, they, they could go anywhere. They could see anything. They have metadata of everything. And they can't just they can't just go like, oh, uh, here's a guy's house in India where he makes 47 percent of the calls to illinois saying that their vehicle warranty expired and he needs to, the, the the recipient needs to send their social security card and routing number what are we like what the fuck i mean like we're, we're never getting rid of the nsa obviously it, it's no. just one of those things so one of those things that everyone will live with until this entire thing comes down like student loans but what the fuck is it doing it can't do anything about this are you serious? And again, like it should be like we are the only country in the world where this is a thing. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure there are, there are phishing phone calls in other countries, but I mean, like that we, we all know. It. Everyone who has a cell phone knows that like any number that you get that's not in your contact book, don't pick up the phone. Well, I will and, say that America has much looser uh, personal data sale r- regulations than any other country, well, every uh, any other industrialized country. Yeah, because like, it's, I mean, it has to because it's the only. It's the only new thing that you can make money off. Of, exactly. Like, we data. basically have replaced uh, the petrodollar with the data dollar at this point. And that va- those things only have value because we have a- access to them. Yeah. Uh, if you um, if you've been to Europe and you try just go to like a news website, you usually go to like it runs, it loads about like 90 percent faster. And, and all that like Chrome crashing that happens in America, it doesn't happen over there. All that, all of that is just like data mining. Everything runs like shit here because you could just mine everything from everybody. But in the EU, where there is some regulation on it, 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 your shit doesn't just brick like that. We were also probably never going to change this because, yeah, like there has to be something. There has to be something because it's like it, it, it's either that or companies that lose 70 billion dollars a year in a quest to gain total market share while also having the secondary benefit of 
providing a more precarious middle class with the experience of having servants. Yeah. yeah. Like that data is essentially worthless. It's just the collective decision that it's hypothetically effective to, to use in market uh, ads. Uh, that's, that's the collective, that's the same as the lie that, you know, like the U S dollar uh, is backed by something like you have to believe it for the circulation to take place. It's incredibly easy to just get a bunch of phone numbers uh, pinned to like any consumption choice in America. It, it, it's it's incredibly easy. I mean, one might say that America is the real Romeo dialer's paradise. I guess that way, you, like you could look at like this thing as yeah, like a necessary black market parasitic part of the greater uh, data economy. You know, like you got the legal pharmaceutical industry, and then you've got illegal drug trafficking, and but they're both necessary. It, it's like how it, yeah, you you could theoretically stop all drugs from entering the United States if you screened every single shipment that comes in but that is absolutely impossible same deal here i mean it just used to me like you can whether it's like student student loan relief or legalizing marijuana uh easy things that biden you know could do but doesn't and won't do and people will say well you know those are issues that only appeal to like people who are going to vote for him anyway and you know like there's a certain amount of truth to that but when it comes to the fucking the scam phone calls that annoy everyone. I think this is an issue that like everybody can get behind or it's not just like, you know, snotty young people or just like, you know, the assholes that voters don't like. I, I, I think like, you know, voting tax paying Americans could get behind. I mean, they would get behind it for sure, but I don't really think that they're going to, they're going to credit Brandon enough to uh, pick him again and his party no, again. Probably I just not. don't. I just don't think so. I think it's, yeah, it's way too late. There's too many other things associated with the brand and brand, you know? Did like you it's see basically it? nothing but bad uh, relationships? Like people's, people, the checks people were getting suddenly stopped after Biden became president. Yeah. Uh, inflation erupted yeah, but, but for Matt, the first wait, time wait, in 40 Matt, years. I mean, like, did those, those people weren't really expecting $2,000, though. I mean, come on. Weren't, weren't they paying attention? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no one said $2,000. Um, Yeah, I mean, in the, in the current way of doing things, the next president was always going to be the guy who comes in after unemployment flows for the first time in a lot of people's memories. You know, this was 2020 and, and like the first like week of 2021. For a lot of people, that is the first time in their life that they ever saw the federal government give them anything. Mm -hmm. That is the first time, the first and only fucking time. The guy who comes in right after it is is like, OK, substitutes gone, wheeling the TV out of the class. It's quiz time. <laughs> and it was it was always going to be that in this current system. Right. Because it's like, you know, the dreaded tight labor market. We can't have that. But insofar as that, it was never going to not be the case that Biden would be the guy who turns the spigot off. Those people are also never going to like him. And that is nope. just reality. I mean, I did see some cross tabs that show Biden um, above water, head above water with the silent generation. With the silent generation. It's Amazing. awesome. Amazing. Because they they identify with him. Yeah. He's up there. He's he's very confused. <laughs> People are telling him he shouldn't do it. And it reminds him of when their kids gently uh, asked him if they maybe shouldn't drive their car anymore. And uh, young people also hate him. Yeah, exactly. And the vice versa. People hate him, it's and like, vice versa. Well, fuck you. <laughs> yeah, like I, I, I can still fucking drive. OK, what? I hit a shopping cart. It was fine. Well, uh, here are some uh, here are some other ideas for the, uh, the midterms. This comes courtesy of uh, Jennifer Rubin in The Washington Post. Four things Biden could do to help Democrats in the midterms, beginning with uh, first, he can venture beyond the White House more than he has. It's baffling that his administration announced last week its dramatic release of one million barrels of oil a day from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve for, from the White House. Why not talk to energy workers in Texas or set up a podium somewhere in Pennsylvania? Um, I think can is <laughs> I, I don't know about the choice of the word can. <laughs> The White House might be nervous about aggravating environmentalists who are not thrilled about reliance on carbon-based fuels, but Biden has already made the policy call. He might as well get credit for it. A two- or three-day tour around the country focused on cutting fuel prices would boost visibility. Okay, okay, Jennifer. Okay, B Biden White House uh, memo to Jennifer Rubin. 
we we love credit for this, but here's the problem: we don't really like letting Joe out of the White House. Yeah, we don't, that's we, we don't let. You just let, last time we did that, um, he almost uh, started World War Three when he, <laughs> yeah, he got he a little just, off the he cuff. Got, he got weepy. He heard he heard a a fucking illin pipe in the background, and he decided to just become the fucking weepy Mick that nearly ended civilization. <laughs> No, we so, can't let him out. Yeah, let's, let's just let him. Let's just let him out unsupervised among yeah. some energy workers in Pennsylvania and Texas. The, uh, <laughs> the Leslie Nielsen uh, silver screen version of Mister Magoo. That would be the vibe. Just walking onto a construction site, wandering onto a fucking uh, an I beam that just goes into the air, <laughs> and then just walking off just as it gets onto uh, one of the levels. <laughs> Uh, proposal number two from uh, Ruben is the White House can drop the Build Back Better proposal. Instead, propose a bill to fight inflation with just two parts, cutting the deficit with new taxes on the uber rich and cutting prescription drug prices. That's it. No more talk about child care, universal pre-K and the rest. If Democrats can survive the midterms, they can come back for those items later. Cutting drug prices would be good policy and good politics. Let Republicans vote it down on the Senate floor. At the same time, the White House should hammer the 193 Republicans who voted last week against reducing insulin prices, many of whom voted to support a similar insulin cost-cutting measure under the defeated former president. Den- apparently denying Biden a win is more important than preventing millions of diabetes patients from getting gouged. Here's how Biden can put it. Republicans not only want to scrap the Affordable Care Act, but are happy to see Americans pay unnecessarily high prices for insulin and other medications. I mean, come on. This is a no brainer. Can you believe? Can you believe the Republicans voted against slightly reducing copays for people who already have insurance and need insulin? It's not like the Republicans could respond with an absolutely bulletproof uh, a counterattack that would nullify the entire issue to any swing voter who might, you know, catch this. Uh, no, we don't. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, no, yeah. We want to lower. We want to lower insulin prices. That's it. Boom. I mean, like, why, like, why should I listen to you when you tell me that that's what they think, Brandon? Like the, nothing that they say has credibility. So their accusations mean nothing. And the Republicans will lie. <laughs> I mean, like the first thing Trump tried to do, like his first major project after the Muslim ban and everything was trying to just make it so your health insurance company could kill you. And it did like it took about 50 other things to get Democrats to take the House in the following in the following year. Yeah, no, it's 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 hard to imagine why uh, why Biden isn't doing this. You know, let's 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 get those insulin prices down and, and, and you know, let's crow about it. But I mean, yeah, like the, the, the bill they're talking about, though, was about like it was about co-pays for insulin. You know, I mean, so once again, in our idiotic fucking barbaric private health, it's not exactly reducing the cost of insulin or better yet, having the government just produce insulin and just at cost and give it to people. We could Man, do that. that would be so easy. Yeah, <laughs> it is wild how easy that would be yeah, yeah. relatively. Oh, yeah. Just in terms of dollar terms and infrastructure, it's doable in it's a way not, that a lot of the stuff. I, I, insulin I, is not an mRNA vaccine. Yeah, like it, you, it's not just like hypothetically creatable. Like the system we have could actually do that realistically. Yeah, it would be you could even repurpose TSA people to do it. Even yeah. they could do it. Even they could work in the factory. But I mean, it, it, this is another thing. It's like the it, it's like the telemarketer calls. It's like anything else. The best course of action for everyone for the most amount of people would be to completely nationalize the healthcare system mm-hmm. not like not medicare for all like a, a single payer government health insurance would just be the greatest fucking bilking project of the criminal american medical industry the world has ever seen they would bleed it of like 3 trillion dollars yeah. a week like the entire medical system is built on overbilling bloat uh inefficiency in- inefficiency is the prime driver of profits in it create the best result for the most people, you would completely nationalize it. You would have an American NHS. You would have the government make most pharmaceuticals, if not all. You would, yeah, have government insulin factories. But again, you can't do that because it's like, well, what the what, what the fuck? Uh, now people can't get their associate's degree in medical billing and make yeah. $75,000 yeah. a year as an extortionist. Yeah, I can't well, they, do that. You had, no, it's it, wild. I'm sorry, go. No, I was going to say, like, uh, well, then you'd have Brandon Friedman piping up to be like, Here's a bone I have to pick with national health care systems. If we give everyone the same medical care, what will incentivize people to get better medical care? Yeah, no. The like limited scope of Democrats on health care is I mean, it, it can't be anything but limited. 
doctors seem to be like shittier than they've been since they worked at the barber shop. <laughs> just, just by virtue that we're not making that many more of them, that the entire growth of the medical field has been, you know, medical you gotta keep billers, those, you gotta, uh, administrative you gotta keep jobs. Those choke points narrow. You got yeah. you to keep it so that those okay, people well, actually, on the other side of it can maintain their rent seeking capacity. Right. Yeah, no, right. But, no, but get, no Democrat, no Democrat will really like talk about it because it's like, well, what the, what the fuck you're giving up the get, this is one of our only things. One of our I, only things is the, is the uh, hospital fun house in America. That's one of our only profit centers. You know, what's wild. Uh, so by the 1970s, uh, when the technology of dialysis had become like sufficiently advanced, somebody who had like a uh, chronic kidney failure could be kept alive indefinitely if they had access to uh, dialysis. Uh, and that of course is a problem in a for profit sector because, you know, if you can't afford something, you can't get it. And we now have a situation where there's this disease, this, this kidney disorder that if you don't get this thing, you will not might, you will die. And so in the 1970s, Nixon passed a law basically exempting dialysis from the healthcare market and making it a directly provided like public good because it's not optional the way other healthcare is, but that's, it, and it, 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 it's just because of like the starkness of it, but it, it uh, really un- emphasizes the underlining absurdity because all of it is necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And look well, specifically at like fucking insulin is the same thing. If you don't get insulin, you will die. Will. So yeah. why the shit is this not part of this general uh, understanding we have that life saving treatments have to be provided? And when the federal government or a state government says something is necessary, like in states where they say like children's dental health care is necessary, what that usually means is that the shittiest fucking providers for that thing that has been declared necessary will start like, you know, there's this trend of uh, children's dentist office that uh, that bill Medicaid that there was an awful case I heard of just this like fucking run down shack where they would just like drill ca- drill cavities for kids that didn't have cavities like 50 100 a day just to bill medicaid a few thousand dollars where they gave a kid like buprofen and killed him and that th- that is that is always going to be the result of declaring something necessary in our current system unless you had like yeah a state run dentist office right i should say and not just I a say. medicaid extortion scheme uh, the publicly provided uh, dialysis treatment in America is terrible and in, uh, filled with uh, incredible corruption and graft. Uh, but that's because it's just weird little mutant, just the same way that the VA sucks, because it's it's not it's it's just this weird uh, offshoot of a general healthcare market that is just poisonous and eats the fucking foundation of everything it's fucking connected to. And I think what no, yeah, you have to, you just have to kill the beast. You have yeah. to kill the beast. And people love, people love like bringing up people. They never give a shit about when you say this. They go, oh, what happens to the people that work for the insurance companies? Okay. Get a new fucking the, job. Yeah. What happened to the fucking shit about the steel workers when they yeah. closed the factories in America? You didn't give a shit. Yeah. And you know what? Okay, fine. The lowest paid workers for the insurance companies, they can now work for the new American NHS. They can. Yeah, they can, that's, that's going to take bureaucrats for Christ's yeah. sake. The highest level. Um, Well, you know, if this is happening, we're living in my best possible world. So they're <laughs> yeah, already been executed. Things. Yeah, I can think of a few things. <laughs> they're, they're, they're they don't have the to worry about employment. Supermax. Right, like the, the actual jobs that would be lost in the healthcare sector, like the ones that couldn't be replaced in a public uh, healthcare system are people who would should be lucky that they aren't in front of a firing squad. Yeah. And, and, it's and like, you know, who yeah. gives a shit about them? They're you know lucky what? that we let them live. And we, I, I mean, I don't mean, I just, I don't just mean like health insurance executives. I mean, hospital CEOs. Yes, uh, of course. People, people who run these Medicaid, Medicaid extortion rackets, like the children's dentist office, all of them killed her in prison. By the way, isn't it, uh, as an aside, isn't it hilarious that the single largest uh, Medicare uh, defrauder in history is in the United States Senate? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> After serving yeah. two terms as governor in the state of Florida. He's got, he's, yeah, by the way, he's got a great plan to fix America. I mean, yeah, he's the one yeah. who, like uh, yeah. Mitch McConnell is over here like, look, never interfere with your enemy when they're in the process of uh, branding it. So to be the the null option compared to the status quo that everyone hates and dumbass fucking Rick Scott is Leroy Jenkinsing his ass. 
in uh, on the field going like, no, wait a minute, here's some horribly unpopular programs <laughs> is, yeah. that ideas, everyone hates. His I, ideas I, I, include I, I, raising taxes on basically anyone who isn't a millionaire and yep. including, a, a, adding a sunset clause to all, fi- all federal legislation, which <laughs> would make it have to be voted on every five years. Yep. Rick Scott, a uh, horrible criminal, completely hostile to anyone making less than $1.5 million a year, only supports unpopular policies. But, you know, elected twice to the United States Senate, still a rising star just because of how handsome he is. Yeah. You know, it's really <laughs> unfair. Get, you get, it's true. Everywhere it, on looks. It's pretty yeah. It's pretty much bullshit. It's like, how are you supposed to compete against that punim? That's um, what seriously, saying. that's the other thing. Hi. Hello. He introduced himself to Florida as, hi, I'm a guy who got busted for scamming billions with a B of money from the uh, health system that you, senior citizens of Florida, depend on. Uh, oh, and by the way, I also look like one of the silent men from Buffy, the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> I'm actually a a walking corpse, and they're like, right. "Sign me the fuck up." How do you lose a federal like, to a guy that looks like that? How it's it just it it shows you that like this Florida only happens the because the because the Democrats are the only are the party that has the disadvantage in the current system of having to have a positive proposal because. The undergirding assumption of democratic governance is, is that the government as it exists uh, could hypothetically be used to, you know, fix things. So they have to have an agenda to use it. Republicans opening bid is that it's all uh, actually the government is the reason things are bad and we should just dismantle it. And if there are problems when we're in charge, it's because we didn't get to dismantle as much as we need to. And if that's your fucking opening bid, you don't have to have anything to stand on. You can be the healthcare gargoyle. If you're the healthcare gargoyle standing opposed to a democratic status quo that is failing, then it's rational to pick him because, hey, at least it's different. Uh, just, a, just a concluding thought on the, uh, the, the evil that undergirds much of the American healthcare system. I think a thread running throughout all of it is uh, that doctors, sort of similar to landlords, maybe perhaps slightly more justified because they actually do do something important. Uh, they all believe that they're entitled to make as much money as humanly possible, and any exactly yeah. any any That's attempt, a God-given right. And like as like if they had to if they had to have like one boat instead of two, then that that's like no one would become a doctor. Okay, uh, here here's a policy proposal to fix that. Um, give like the VIP all access fucking visa and citizenship to basically anyone in this country of India who's graduated medical school to come to America yeah. and be a doctor. Bye bye cartel. Uh, fucking mm-hmm. yeah! Compete with those. Compete with the. Compete with fifty million Indian doctors tomorrow, asshole. That's a great idea. That is a great idea. We do not have nearly enough doctors, uh, and you know you see the same structural problems here that you see everywhere else. But in the end, they don't want to make the trade of like, you know, maybe your 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 hypothetical ceiling is a little lower in America, but um, there is a just insane blood boiling. Hideous, hideous uh, misery everywhere you look. But uh, just a, very, very few people that vote really want to make that trade. Uh, Ruben's last two examples of uh, things Brandon can do. Uh, third, Biden can embrace anti-corruption measures. This includes the bill championed by Representative Abigail Spanberger of Virginia in the House and Senators John Ossoff and Mark Kelly in the Senate that would ban individual stock ownership among lawmakers. And why has the White House not embraced measures to beef up the Hatch Act and give inspectors general protection against dismissal without cause and the tools they need to rigorously root out wrongdoing? Such bills are essential to democracy and would demonstrate Democrats' commitment to transparency. I got to say, the only way that Brian... Brandon could possibly run as a plausible anti-corruption candidate is if he had a press conference and he brought out Hunter and sawed his head off like Nick Berg. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're, you got the laptop boy. How are you going to be the fucking anti-corruption candidate? And Fuck uh, out of here. Finally, Biden can call out the GOP's hypocrisy on crime and border security. Congress can pull out the put out the administration's proposals to fund law enforcement and secure border and secure the border and put them on the floors of both chambers in a substantial bill to keep Americans safe and secure. Biden has ample funding for both in his budget request, but it will remain hidden in the mass of spending priorities unless Democrats make an effort to highlight them. Oh, God. See, this is my favorite shit. And this is this is the real proof that these people, they don't live in a bubble. They live in a fucking septic tank that's buried the hundreds of feet below the ground. So she's thinking, 
oh, if they if they put together, it's not because obviously you can't. It's nothing to say, hey, Brandon, uh, talk about how much you love the cops and want to smooch them. He does that all the time. He do, cannot stop talking about how much he wants to fund the police. He's filmed. He's he's doing a uh, Weird Al parody version of Fuck the Police called Fund the Police, and it's going to be released on Funny or Die next week. Doesn't matter. But she thinks, oh, he can intensify this if they make it a fat battle over legislation so that there's a bill in Congress and that the Republicans who have to go on the record opposed to it and that this is a drama that the American people can engage with. The only people on earth who are paying attention to that shit are in the septic tank. They cannot determine the fucking outcome of an election. No one outside of that bubble cares about that level of a grit in the political system. They care about what the vibe is in their life. I mean, this is, this is the stuff that riveted people in the 60s when people thought the government did something and there were stakes for legislation. And people remember that like, oh, the drama of passing the civil rights bill. That's gone now. Nobody fucking cares about legislation. Uh, well, uh, Brandon, you got your work cut out for you, buddy. Yeah, good luck, Brandon. Yeah. Good, good luck, Brandon. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's go, Brandon. Hey, let's how, go. Fun, well, how funny would it be if like, a minute after this episode comes out, he's like, "Okay, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Bonapartist. I'm, I'm nationalizing the healthcare system." <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I, I gotta say, if you're rooting for the Democrats, like any, have any like emotional investment in their, uh, in their prospects this fall, I really want to know why. I, um, I gotta know what you think, what you think you're you're supporting or protecting from the Republicans well, here. Yeah, well, Matt, no, I, mean, I think I, you would I, say. Is that like, you know, you're looking at a situation where like it was a, that guy David Shore was talking about this, where like the Republicans may get a filibuster proof trifecta, uh, but by once again receiving a minority of the votes in an election. But to that, my answer is um, good, because like the continuing legitimacy of the American political system is the greatest threat to our ongoing survival. Y- y'all, you guys, you guys hear about that ICP report that just came out? I certainly did not read it. I don't read that kind of thing. But from the gist, from the vibe that I get from it, uh, it's very hard for me to square the continued uh, existence of human civilization as we understand it with what? A second Brandon term that's going to fix things? That's going to do anything to mitigate the fucking path we're on? Like this system, this legitimacy that that undergirds it uh, is a necessary component for maintaining a unsustainable uh, global order. I mean, I, I kind of see Brandon winning again. Uh, as we'll for see, the- like, I mean, it obviously depends. Like, we have to kind of assume that, like, that the that uh, the cycle goes around the other way, and like, you don't have runaway inflation in like three years, or uh, or you know, that like maybe there was a recession, you know, that starts right now, say, and that yeah. has time to like be on an upswing again uh, when Brandon runs for re-election, uh, and yeah. Trump, if Trump really just like goes ham on like relitigating 2020 is the only thing he talks about uh he could definitely win but yeah. i mean my god these midterms are, are are cooked yeah no that 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 bird's cooked but yeah no i i cannot understand anyone rooting for anything except for like the possibility of an american chavez or Gaddafi yeah, somewhere in the exactly military. that's what our nation revolution for. should be like if you're if you're going to invest political energy in caring about anybody you should be going down to your local military base Going into the officers XO and just like just trying to strike up a conversation. Yeah, here, here, See here's what's going what, on yeah. at the mid officers level. Here's what my, I'm rooting my, my for. Wife here, and here's I like here's your my vibe. fucking here's my cross tabs for the midterms. I hope that if you are out there, you are the most charismatic lieutenant in, in your entire base. Yeah, and I hope that you are listening to us uh, in our plan of uh, federal prison and executions for everyone, ev- all profiteers in the United States healthcare system. And uh, nationalization of gay industries. Hope you're listening. If you are just a handsome military officer and you're not charismatic yet, I hope that you're watching those YouTube videos called like uh, the the man foretold, where it tells you how to have charisma <laughs> like Don Draper, and you're using yeah. dark triad tactics to create a base of supporters in your unit. Uh, if you're out there, hope you're not in Fort Bragg. They will <laughs> yeah, seriously, uh, they're, yeah, they're no. summoning. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're like summoning something there. Yeah, like those guys are all doing like night work in the basement, like trying to reanimate some fucking like corpse that they found at the bottom of the Marianas Trench. Yeah. So the the, 
uh, the outer god of blood lives above Fort Bragg, so you're not going to want to like do this there. If you're listening, no, to no, this and the you, vibes you're, are too yeah. fucked at Fort Bragg. Yeah, uh, no, yeah. You know, uh, people talk about it. salting. People talk about salting, uh, like Amazon warehouses. You know, people in, on the labor movement on the left, like getting jobs uh, at those places to try to drum up union support. I fully endorse that. I think people should do that if it's in your means. If if you're looking for a job and you don't have, if, you know, you have multiple prospects, that's not a bad idea. It, I, mm-hmm. Staten Island shows that, like, if people apply, like, on the ground, real uh, effort to the work of organizing these warehouses, uh, they can do it. And so, by all means, go for it. But we also need people salting the DMs of military TikTokers. Yes. We need people talking to these charismatic high follower military tiktokers get in their ear so that they can be the faces of yeah the american incarnation revolution that we need yeah oh and it's like oh you're a bonapartist yes what are you gonna do about it <laughs> yes yes i am Enough about politics. Enough about the midterms. Gentlemen, let's talk Morbius. Yeah, and folks, go. let's get yeah. morbed up. Let's get morbed okay. up. Okay, guys, here's the thing. Morbius, he may be an outsider, but one thing he's not, <laughs> a champion of the marginalized. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, think, I think that, like, you know, I think about marginalized communities, and probably the most marginalized are people whose names are on, like, some type of list. And yeah, like, there, there's maybe like a map saying where they live. Guys, there's there's a very interesting article in NBC Think by uh, a prominent cultural critic. And I, I'm just going to read it because he's got a very interesting take on this new Morbius movie. I have not seen it yet, but, you know, I, I've been thinking Morbius all the time. But like, I'll just say that this complicates my love of Morbius. So uh, let's dive in. Uh, in Bram Stoker's original novel. The foreign perverse Dracula is almost universally read to stand in for immigrants, queer people, and Jews. No, no. Maybe (laughs) immigrants. I might give you immigrants. We could talk about it, but I'm not. I am not budging on Jews or queers. Wrong. Shut the fuck up. My my dear, come with me into the night. And do do you have any Benadryl? (laughs) I never drink milk. (laughs) Uh, when asked to choose sides you rooted for the virtuous british heroes not the blood-sucking count yeah because he's a murderer yeah well because yeah he feeds off the blood. he murders people he kills human beings (laughs) that's the thing vampires do that's like their defining characteristic is that they kill people they murder people is what they do in the new marvel superhero film morbius the vampire is the good guy what he is and what he is not however is a champion of the marginalized oh fuck off what kind of hero? What kind of good guy could he be if he's not championing the marginalized? Although Dracula has long represented the outsider, Morbius spends the whole film trying to be more normal. Brilliant doctor Michael Morbius. Wait, the guy's name is Mike. Is Mor- the guy's is name is Michael Morbius. Morbius. <laughs> His name is Michael Morbius. Brilliant doctor Michael Morbius, Jared Leto, has a rare condition that leaves him weak, barely able to walk, and in constant need of blood transfusions. Damn, so, sucks to be you, homie. So he dedicates his life to studying this disorder and defeating it. He That's first a little develop- selfish. <laughs> he first develops artificial blood, which saves millions of lives, but doesn't cure his own illness. Then, because this is a superhero movie, he turns to splicing human and bat DNA. Experiments, as you'd expect, go awry, and before you can say origin story, he is a superpowered bat creature that needs to feed on blood. In addition to uh, the connection to illness and disability, vampires and Morbius are also coded as queer. As a child, Morbius becomes close friends with another similarly afflicted boy named Milo, played by Matt Smith. We see Milo early in the film being badly bullied by a group of boys who target him in part because he's weak and can't walk. But they also come after him because he's reading what is essentially a love letter sent by Morbius. The explicit, <laughs> the explicit queer bashing gives a pointed, painful edge to Milo's repeated insistence to Morbius that we are the few against the many. It also colors Milo's obvious jealousy of Morbius's co-researcher and romantic interest, Dr. Martine Bancroft. Milo helps fund Morbius's efforts to find a cure for both of them. But while Morbius is horrified by the bloodlust caused by his cure, Milo embraces it. I'm not ashamed of what I am, he declares. And he tries a murderer. To convince, 
<laughs> he tries to convince Morbius he shouldn't be ashamed either. Of killing people. You should probably be ashamed of killing people if you do it. The separatist supervillain is a common trope from Magneto of the X-Men franchise to Killmonger in Black Panther. Often the script will acknowledge that the bad guy has a point. Mutants are oppressed in X-Men stories. Black people are oppressed in Black Panther and in real life. <laughs> oh, thank you, Noah. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> wait, is, is, wait, who wrote this? Is this wait, is Noah? Okay, I guess it's the name of the cultural critic. I, mean, I, I, didn't look who, I didn't look who wrote this article. I just thought it was good, <laughs> so I decided to share it with you. Uh, Magneto and Killmonger seek excessive revenge, we're supposed to think, but their call for justice has some merit. Milo isn't, acknowledged, isn't accorded that much sympathy. The movie doesn't acknowledge its LBGTQ themes or how disability is compounded by the callousness of adults as well as the bullying of children. Milo's rants are just rants. We're not supposed to see his complaints as having any merit. Morbius does occasionally admit that being super strong is fun and he has a bond with bats. There are scenes where he's flying amid all the CGI gunk that the story seems to be reaching ineffectually, but still, for a lyrical celebration of weird, queer, goth transcendence. But those <laughs> moments are fleeting and underdeveloped. Morbius never talks to Milo about the experiences they share as vampires or contemplates the way marginalization has shaped him. He just wants to be normal and hetero and settle down with Martine. You don't cheer for Morbius the vampire. You root for Morbius to defeat the vampire within, symbolized by Milo. Yes, he has okay, to. Okay, yeah, but he like kills people is the thing. The problem is he doesn't he doesn't identify with the the predator within, if you will. Right, there's of a, course there's not. A, there's a predator inside him, and oftentimes predator like you know predators are marginalized by society, and yeah. um, some and some might say unjustly persecuted for their crime of uh, feeding off the living. Yeah, there's something uh, I don't know. The author here seems to have an instinctive uh, sympathy for those who uh, for the are, marginalized, yeah, predatory, yes. predatory the, uh, on the society that they're part of, and kind of weirdly defines like tolerance as like being okay with them doing it. It's very weird. Cause like vampires really don't work as metaphors for oppression because they're aristocrats who drink blood, <laughs> you know, like it's what they actually do as opposed to maybe like the weather belts that they wear or whatever the fuck. Like, I think that's more defining of the character and it's weird how that's just not part of the equation at all. This lack of sympathy is especially frustrating because in many ways, it's never been a better time to be a vampire, at least culturally. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Tell me more. Anne Rice, Stephanie Meyer, and numerous other writers have created romantic, appealing vampires who suggest to one degree or another that Bram Stoker was wrong about Dracula and that marginalized people aren't inherently an evil parasitic threat. Uh, but just, no, neither just, of those are like closer than 10 years old, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> That's a very long moment. I just think oftentimes people who are deemed monsters by society are, you know, the real heroes of the story. Yeah, often. And I think I think, I think that's what's, I think that's what's important often here. The sweetest ones yeah. you'll meet. Yeah. The most obvious example in this context is that other the Marvel vampire film Blade starring Wesley Snipes. The film played with negative stereotypes linking black people with addiction but it also celebrated Blade's outsider status. He is a hero because he's black and because he's a vampire, not despite those things. Like Milo, he's not ashamed. Well, he's also not a vampire. He's a daywalker. He doesn't drink blood. He's literally not a vampire. That's the whole point. I, I gotta, I gotta say, I was, I was pretty on board with, with this NBC Think piece about Morbius, but I gotta really take issue with the author's uh, the idea that that blade is is, is somehow link is a metaphor linking black people to addiction. Uh, I'm I'm not I'm not seeing that in blade. I mean he he has to keep injecting himself with a drug. Yeah, that's it. But it's not. Yeah, like but it's not. But it's not like the... a, it's not a it's not like really a a drug that he wants or I, I, I don't know. It's just that 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 that's, that's a reading that I find a little bit confused. Unlike the rest of this uh, article. Well, he's got a problematic quota for everything he consumes. He's got to have at least one. He's got to throw at least one flag on the play. Everything he consumes? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one exception. Yeah. Okay, so just rounding it out here. Morbius, then, is a superhero story about defeating outsiders and monsters rather than a story about how those outsiders and monsters can be heroes or about how we should maybe rethink our definitions of heroes and monsters. I guess that's what Morbius wano wanted, but Milo deserved better. I mean, like, that's the important thing here. There, there, there are people who are deemed outsiders and monsters, but sometimes they, like they, they, in fact, they are the heroes, and we should rethink our definitions about a lot of things. 
heroes yeah. and monsters being some of them. We should rethink a lot of other cultural definitions about what is monstrous or yeah. not monstrous behavior. Outdated notions of propriety and legality, you know, decency, things like that. But I mean, I think it's, you know, uh, I'm still going to see Morbius, but I got to say, I think it's I think it's high time that we have a vampire who's a champion of the marginalized. We need a marginalization champion vampire. It's got to happen. By the way, I, I have not yet seen Morbius, uh, but I have good authority from someone who has seen Morbius that the, the plot is absolutely nothing like what is described in like basic stuff. Completely incorrect. What? This is, yeah. this, is, this is an NBC think piece by a renowned culture. I critic. know. You'd think that NBC would have uh, better thoughts than this. You'd think that I a mean, self-aware uh, like uh, corporate AI would be able to put something better out than this. Well, I mean, like the one thing that the NBC think, um, they really do. They, like, they, they know how to get clicks and eyeballs on pieces, you know, by, by, by the cultural critics that they continue to allow to write for them. So congratulations to them and congratulations to Morbius. Congrats, he, he, Morbius! Number one film in the in the in the U.S. We always believed in you. Number one we film. We never in the thought world. you were going to bomb. We never He's said a, who the hell is for his is this for. We never said any of those things. We never He's, just said the name Morbius over and over again. Uh, we, we never did impressions of David Letterman uh, being played by Norm Macdonald. Going, hey, you enjoy the Morbius, Paul? Ah, Morbius. Morbius. <laughs> Morbius. 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 And then and then Mark McKinney as. Uh, Paul, Paul Schaefer goes, ha, yeah, Morbius. <laughs> Morbius. I, just, ha! I wish Morbius would stop being ashamed of who he is. I a honestly living, think so a, a living vampire. A, a living, living vampire. vampire. A living vampire who... Apparently that's he, very important to the lore is that he is a living vampire. He feeds because off the blood. Are, of there the are de- regular dead vampires in the Marvel Universe. Blade kills them, for example. But he is not. He is a living vampire. Are there any dragons in uh, uh, Marvel? <laughs> yes, there are. Yes, there are. Uh, Felix, may I introduce you to a little a little dragon I like to call Fing Fang Foom? That's a terrible name. A dragon would never be named that. That's so <laughs> stupid. Dragons, okay. Dragons have two types of names. You know, there are the kinds of dragons that are like raised or, uh, you know, sort of grow up around men. You know, created dragons or younger dragons. They have names like you know, man killer. Just a stupid name a person would give them. Uh, ancient dragons, the important kind, the r- real ones that exist, have names like uh, Quasiloxix or Oblovik. <laughs> it would never be called what th- th- this one is. Fim Fam Foom. Fim Fam Foom. Not a fucking dragon name. Maybe a serpent could be named that. <laughs> stupid. Um, is he a Wervin? Yes, yeah. Maybe a wyvern would be named that. I, I no, he's sort of he's sort of a more of a, an Eastern style dragon. Mm. I know there are dragons mm. in that uh, Legend of Chun Li movie or Shang Chi. Well, I I don't know. I think that um, they don't really know what the fuck they're. They don't know anything about dragons. They don't know them like I do. Where do you stand on a uh, Smaug, Felix? Smaug. That's a good name. Like like Smaug? Name. That's yeah. That's a name that would be in like the Dragon Bible. That's like naming your son David. It really is the AU that kill that does it. If it was Smog, S M O G, lame dork. That's a nerd ass dragon. That's like a tiny runt dragon. That's uh, you know like always falling behind and 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 like when it tries to blow uh, fire, it just gets a little smoke curl out of its nostrils. Yeah. Uh, it has tiny little wings, smaller than the body, and he has to flap them really hard. But yeah, that's Smaug, the, yeah. That's a serious dragon. What you just described, by the way, is basically like a minstrel show for dragons, and I hate seeing it. But um, I think like so Morbius, everyone knows Morbius bit up the box office, right? <laughs> you know, Morbius drank the blood of the box office. The haters have been silenced. It's the summer of Morbius. It's the year of Morbius. But I mean, I think that means one thing. Americans uh, are back in love with the supernatural. There was a scary time under Trump when, you know, uh, we were afraid to think about things like vampires and dragons. But now that he's gone and never coming back ever, we can think about these things. I think that the next thing, and maybe this could be a Marvel property, I would definitely like to help them with their childish conceptions of dragons. It should be a, a dragon sitcom where the only characters are dragons. Sort of like dinosaurs. Exactly like dinosaurs. But I, th- I think like, to answer questions we all have about like how dragons get their name, dragon hierarchies, what do dragons do day to day? And you know, what's day to day life like when you're an eternal being? 
And would this be like a, a, a sitcom in which the entire world is dragons? Or is this like a dragon, a dragon family moving into a suburban neighborhood and having to like fit in and make new friends and stuff? Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. Kind of like the boondocks for dragons. Oh, there you go. Yeah, that's the name of the show. The boondocks for dragons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another billion dollar idea minted here on Chapo Trap House, copyright Man. protected. All right, um, uh, would you guys mind if I plug uh, the show I'm doing with uh, Jacques and Pot Pot about list at uh, Littlefield? Oh, go right ahead. Quick plug: I will be uh, a guest at uh, Jacques from Seeking Derangements, the podcast Dream Live Show coming to Littlefield in Brooklyn on April fifteenth, featuring myself, Pot about list. And uh, Amber Frost will be attending as well. And there'll be DJ sets. There'll be podcasts. There'll be myself. Doors at 7 p.m. April 15th, Littlefield. Check it out. I just uh, DM'd Jacques because I realized I, I thought I wasn't going to be there then to see if I can also do it. So Okay, it. so Felix will be a pending guest. Felix. Yeah, and if I'm not there, I'll be outside protesting. So one way or the other, I'll be in the area. I will be in the audience until I have to dip out early to go to a Fatboy Slim concert. Ooh. All right. I have to praise you, Chris, for leaving my Thank show you. early. Um, uh, continuing the plugs, uh, I had a great conversation with uh, Zachary Siegel, a friend of mine who's done amazing uh, journalistic work about the opiate crisis, the tainted drug supply in America, and the minefield of policy, including the much-hated opiate whack-a-mole uh, game that the federal government plays. That is over on Patreon, where we will have also links to Zach's work and his new Substack project. All right, be on the lookout for both of those things. Uh, that does it for us today. Till next time, gentlemen. Bye-bye.